Hello, hello. Come on and join. Hello, hello. Are you here? Hello, hello. You got to connect to audio. Unmute. Okay, I found the unmute. Oh, start video. Dang, you want a lot. Girl, you look good. Oh, I can hear you. I was going to get your butt. I said, now she wait till the last two I minutes. Can't. I can't because I'm only allowed 45 minutes on here. Oh, I got it. Hey, girl. You look great. What'd you do? What's your background? Oh, I painted stripes on my wall. I couldn't get the background to work for some reason. Oh, I like it. Yeah, so I had originally painted as part of my decor stripes on the wall. It looks good. It looks good. We have 47 people coming on, and I don't exactly know how they'll come on. I'm going to check the email right quick to see if we're getting... Um, all right, my participants have joined. Okay, so nobody's giving us an alert. Okay. Like, like oh my gosh um can um how come i'm like really small up here is that normal like you're big and i'm small is that oh, normal? let me see um uh let me see hold on okay i got it i got a half and half deal now how do you oh we do okay good okay um okay yeah i just got off the phone and found out that um, the technology teacher at my, at this pretty conservative school mm -hmm. um, is doing tests on gender now and gave them, it really conservative, gave them five or six questions um, and everybody failed the test because they weren't playing the game. <laughs> it's everywhere. Oh my gosh. When I'm looking at you, am I making like right eye contact or do I need to adjust my laptop thing? Yeah, am I making good eye contact? Oh yeah, you're you're perfectly set, but probably you've done this a little bit more. No. I don't usually I usually do them from my phone. So this oh, will be okay. the first time so I do it from like a what I'm planning okay. What I'm planning on doing is going who we are, mm -hmm. people are leaving the system, mm -hmm. and the reasons why. Then I'm tossing to you because one reason why is because families don't want their children to be relegated to their zip code. For their mm -hmm. educational success. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then, and then I'll probably share. The, I'll share the story of myself and then my brother as well, because to have two yeah. kids in the same family, my brother's fifteen years older than me, so the fact that he had to do a school choice option for disciplinary because he was disengaged because you know he was yeah. like learning at a higher level, and they pegged him as a disciplinary problem when that wasn't it at all. Yeah. Me, I was school choice because I was passing everything with flying colors and they're like, you're too smart. We got to get you something different. So I just think that's a really interesting, you know. It is. It is. And I've homeschooled. So I homeschooled for a year, but the way I did it was I half the price of what private school would be. And I just hired <laughs> tutors and they did it for a whole year. I did it three. I found them on care.com, but people don't know that. So for me, it was really easy peasy. Plus, I had a terrible experience with private school. So I want to tell them that private school is not the panacea. Mm. Okay? Home school you can do. I've done all three. 
So wow, that's good. Yeah, I've done all three. I know the good, the bad, the ugly. Then I've got um, what the options are, how to pay for it, and that there's a lot that we don't know. We're not going to claim to know everything, but we'll go fetch it for you. We'll yeah, yeah. We're going to be like their resource. Yeah, yeah. So let's see. Four people are on. Um, let's see, and they're waiting. So I will let them in in a second. Okay. Um, your your mic is a little staticky. Is that just my end? Only sometimes. How is this up. better? Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's better. Oh, I have my notebook there. Oh, okay. So, okay, cool. So yeah, I'll give it another second. So there's three. There's supposed to be 47. So I'm not going to sweat it. Well, we should just probably let people in when maybe it's about 15 or 10 and then just kind of wait it out and then just kind of, I don't know, chat or just say, hey, everybody, we'll get started in a moment. Okay. All right, let's see if anyone's having a problem. And are we recording this? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, not yet, but I mean, when? <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, I mean, we don't have to have all the answers. It's just school choice week. And yeah. we want to just get, you know, people don't feel cared for and they're panicked. So yeah. I think if they can feel like, you know, we've got a few answers, mm -hmm. not everything, but you know, yeah, we'll get them all. All right. So we've got three waiting, just three though. Let's see. Are they having problems? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Let me go to the Facebook and see. Um, yeah. And then I'm going to circle back. Mm -hmm after um i'm gonna circle back to you and see if you can address that question but yeah i looked over the questions most of them were the same yeah i never even got the questions girly i just got mike carney's thing twice the questions didn't come through all right well i think we'll address enough of it so yeah well i'll just say hey i can jump in on that one you know maybe do it that way and be like hey i can take that one if you want and kind of let that kind of okay, here guide. we go that sounds great. Okay. Hi, everyone. We're going to start letting everyone in. Hello, hello. Hello. Okay. So if you guys will, um, just for the next, we're going to allow 30 seconds. If you can all put yourself on mute just to begin with. Hey, Heather Small. Hey, Sarah. Stephanie, Tracy, hello. Taylor. Okay, everybody, we're gonna go ahead and get started. How's everybody doing better now, right? All right, so um, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, tonight we're gonna provide just a little overview of not only about what Education First Alliance is doing, we're gonna introduce ourselves to you, tell you about our, our background, but also kind of provide a little bit of a, um, a primer on what's available um, in North Carolina, what the options are. We have people tonight from Johnson County, we have people from Wake County. Uh, we have people from Charlotte Mecklenburg. Um, so we've got, there's a lot, uh, a lot of you guys from around the, around the way. And uh, we don't wanna drill down really on one geography. So we're gonna give you an overview um, of, of what the landscape is. And so um, this is Danielle and I'm Sloan. And uh, this is half of our team at Education First Alliance, North Carolina. And what we are is we're a group of activists, parents, some students, um, even teachers um, who, who have come together uh, to fight for uh, the, the equity of opportunity and of dignity. And so in, in public education or in, in education just writ large in North Carolina. 
And so of opportunity is a big one. And that's why we're here tonight, especially ushering in School Choice Week, um, which is, is so great. And so first of all, I wanna tell you that when we're talking about options, and we're talking about you know North Carolina, more people than ever, as you can imagine, North Carolina especially, more people than ever are making the decision to leave the, the government monopoly on education. And, um, and it is scary. And when you think about that and you think about the overview of that, it's really kind of daunting, but it's like the most exciting um, time for school choice ever. Um, and if you can think, and, and we've been here as a country before. So if you can think 30 years ago, we had the post office. When you wanted to get something mailed, right? A box or whatever, you had to go down to the post office and get the job done. If you wanted to mail something overnight, forget about it. Um, if you wanted to you know, mail liquor or whatever, you couldn't do it, right? And so because there were a lot of things that the government in the post office, as an example, couldn't do or wouldn't do, or wouldn't do very well because they had no competition, that ushered in DHL, FedEx, UPS. And so now we're at that time where, um, very fortunately, the country is going, hey, we had a crappy post office. We can send something overnight, let's do it. Um, and so we're, we're in that real, um, that stage of kind of westward expansion, if you will, um, kind of going on the frontier and exploring what, what's out there. And so here are some reasons why before the COVID and the school closures, that people make the decision to go from the, the government monopoly of public schools to a choice option. Uh, number one happens to be security across the board. Um, that is the, the number one reason people make that move. And it, it's for different reasons. Maybe it's smaller class sizes, maybe it's tighter restrictions on who can teach or who can get in and out or, um, you know, just security seems to be one of the top reasons. Um, another one is quality. Uh, a lot of people make the decision because, gee, there's smaller class sizes or individualized learning, or you know, maybe a particular school focuses more on math. Um, you know, like a charter, for instance. So that those are that's another reason. Uh, but one of the reasons that Danielle is going to really tell you guys about, and it's going to be you know up close and personal for her, is that many families decide that they do not want their child's future to be dependent on their zip code. In other words, if you happen to live in an area where you have a low performing school, families want options, they need options, and they benefit from that tremendously. So with that, um, Danielle Nicole Robinson, I will turn it over to you. Hey everybody, happy school choice week. Thank you for being on with us tonight. Um, I will say that it became really important for me to fight and continually fight for school choice because I myself am a school choice, a child of school choice. Um, originally from Brooklyn, New York, uh, I went to the public schools. I grew up, you know, low income. I was pretty much on government everything, so to speak. And I will say that school choice has made the biggest difference in my life. Um, by the time I was maybe 11 years old and being at the top of my class, I was granted school choice because they said, hey, you know, she excels in everything she does at class. She excels with answering questions. And they felt that because I was doing so well with studies that I could be able to be, you know, challenged more. I fight for school choice because I, I was given a choice once they thought that I could excel. But I think that every parent and every child should have the choice for creative and engaging edu educational options, regardless of whether they excel or not. Um, so I remember, you know, testing out and testing into a special high school. I remember also in junior high school, um, being so advanced that they invited me to take college classes in junior high school. So on the weekends, I was invited to go to Medgar, Ever, Medgar, excuse me, Medgar Evers College, and I was learning from college professors. And I will tell you, it made such a difference being a part of an educational um, consortium that sort of brought the textbooks to life. 
and being on a college campus and being around, you know, we're college students, you'd be surprised that some of us that are low income, we never even get the chance to see ourselves attending college. We never get the chance to imagine what it could feel like and that it could be something for us. So at a very young age, having access to school choice, having access to, um, I would say, in-depth educational options made the difference in my life. I also have a brother, my oldest brother. He's about 15 plus years older than me. He was also a child of school choice, but for different reasons. He went to high school and began to not do well in his classes, not do well um, in his grades, not do well sometimes behaviorally. And they pegged him as a, as a student that was, you know, not smart, not as capable. They pretty much thought that he could be a disciplinary problem as well as not being able to graduate on time, but it was the exact opposite. He was not engaged in his schoolwork. And I think that there are a lot of boys and I think that there are a lot of children being pegged with disciplinary issues, being pegged with learning orders, but it's really that they're not engaged in their studies, whether it's, you know, my brother's case, he was more advanced. He was so bored with the level of reading he was at and the level of math that he was at. He simply just, you know, didn't participate in assignments. Now, most kids today in that situation, they could be being overlooked as problem children, as, you know, not as, you know, not as able to excel. And that was totally not the case. So I think on two fronts, you know, fighting for those that are being pegged as disciplinary issues, being pegged as slow learners and saying, hey, we just really need to support parents that want to choose different options for their kids. In my brother's case, it was a guidance counselor who saw something more in my brother and said, you know what, he's not doing well in school, but it's not because he doesn't have the aptitude. I think he needs to be challenged more. So he went to a school that even today, when you look up on their website, they focus on what's called experiential learning, whereas they brought him into the real world in addition to supplementing his you know, regular curriculum. So I just think it's really important that we let parents know that they should have this choice, they have the right to have this choice, and that they should be able to engage and be supported in that choice. And that's what Sloan and I are doing. Great, and so that that gives you, uh, you know, Danielle's giving you a perspective from a, a student, um, which is fantastic. Not only a student, but a student who has um, excelled all through her life, and look at her now. And so, you know, this is this is what you know can can happen, and often does, um, just with you know the benefit of choice. And so, when we talk about what North Carolina has to offer. It's like a basket of stuff, right? And there's three main ones and one cool little burgeoning option that's coming our way. Um, the first one is private school. And uh, there are about 754 of those in North Carolina. The averaging um, between the median is about $8,000 to $9,000 per year. We'll talk about affording that in a little while. Um, then we're also talking about charter schools. So in 63 different counties, I think there's, uh, let me see, 196 um, of those and, and more. They're making more, and I'll tell you about that also in a second. Um, and then there's homeschooling. So um, I am a mom who has done them all. I've had my kids in private school, homeschool, and public school. So I can kind of speak to all of those, but I'm really gonna to touch on homeschooling. So um, we had my children enrolled um, in kindergarten and second grade in a private school. By the way, private schools are no panacea, right? You can't just onboard into any private school. You've got to make sure it's the right fit. But for us, we chose one we didn't know, right? We didn't know what we didn't know. So we chose one that wasn't a great fit. And so, you know, what do we do? So we chose to homeschool, but at the time, both my husband and I were working full-time. So what do you do when you're working full-time, both full-time parents, and you don't have a lot of money? Because that's where we were. So what we did uh, was something a bit innovative, um, and I can help you guys out. If you hear this idea and you like it, I'm gonna help you with it. Um, we took the amount of tuition that it would be to have both children in a private option, and we cut it in half. And we said, okay, 
this is going to be our budget. Um, so the first thing we did, obviously, you've got to apply in North Carolina uh, to the Department of uh, Non-Public Education. You announce that you're going to homeschool. That's the first thing. Second thing we did was this. We said, if we can find tutors or former teachers who we could pay and mix it up, we can make this work. So what we did is we hired three different, I think it was two tutors and one person that did childcare. And from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m., five days a week for half the price of, of private school, we were able to have a homeschool experience. And let me tell you what happened. Um, my kindergartner was reading and doing math at a second grade level. So we had a monster on our hands and our son was doing, um, now he's doing you know, seventh grade and he's doing uh, freshman and college math. So it really, I mean, it provided that one-on-one -on -one attention, choosing our own curriculum. It really, for us, provided a launching pad for really creating two monsters. But it really enabled at that critical time for kids to learn, my kids learned about, you know, art history, history of religions, even in kindergarten. And I was surprised at how much you can really, with homeschool, you can pack in that knowledge because they're, they're able to learn and they're getting that individual attention. So um, that was, that's what we did. Now, now we're in Thales Academy. They have them all over Wake County. I think they're expanding to Mecklenburg, but they're um, $5,500, so affordable. Um, and, um, you know, it's real just cut and dry, you know, the basics. They don't even have a lunchroom. I mean, they make it affordable, but they just, you know, bigger class sizes, et cetera. So there are different options for you. So that's, we talked about homeschool, private schools. Charters are a bit complicated. So right now with the charter schools, um, the interesting thing is according to Terry Stoops, he's at the John Locke Foundation. He's really the, um, he's the expert in this. And actually he's coming on board with Mark Robinson, the Lieutenant Governor to be heading um, all of the charter schools. So um, what he has said uh, yesterday, he did a, a press briefing and said, wow, this is, this is great for North Carolina because, you know, with the, with the General Assembly, the makeup of the General Assembly right now, um, there's a lot of charter advocates and we have really a, a very exciting time to build charters. So um, Dr. Stoops has said that charter schools are now going to be um, uh, increasing. They're going to put them in locations like rural areas, underserved communities, and in fact, this is very exciting, uh, North Carolina is making a plan to deliberately and specifically target communities that are underserved currently by public schools. So let's back up and talk about what a charter is. Charter school is kind of like a private school in that it's, they have the leeway to do what they want, right? So they're getting public money, they don't charge the parents, but they get leeway to do whatever they want. For instance, if there's a charter that wants to focus on um, teaching uh, foreign language or uh, a heavy emphasis on math or arts, um, they have the latitude to do that. So as I said, there's about, uh, there's a lot of demand. So 65 counties, 196, 65,000 people right now on the waiting list to get into charters. So most of them do the application by lottery so if you're, if you're wanting to make that, that change and get your children out of the public school and into a private option, you can do a hybrid of things. Maybe you apply for a charter, you decide to go to a private now and then mix it up. If you've really made a decision you wanna do that, you have options. Um, and so I wanna talk about um, also micro schools. This is kind of a cool concept. I know Danielle, you and I have been trying to figure out what to call it. Yeah, very much so, because it pretty much brought on by the need of the pandemic and the fact that minority children, um, especially, we are falling further and further behind. Um, not only that, with the virtual options that have been imposed upon many parents, sometimes they don't have the households for that. They can't stay from work to make sure that their children are really learning the assignments the way they should be and not just trying to breeze through um, so the idea of creating this micro school 
is a balance to the homeschool option. It, it allows possibly a consortium of families, um, a consortium of parents to get together and have access to a solution, whereas homeschool might not be the best option for them. So we've been trying to develop that because pretty much um, we don't know what's going to go on with the pandemic. Uh, the things that they're trying to push in schools that are so not education related, um, I think that there is going to be an increased need to create a parallel economy when it comes to education so that we'll have these options um, for our children because I believe right now um, the pandemic has brought the conversation up to say, hey, this is actually something that we need. So we've got parents that have never before been a fan of school choice going, I wish there was another option that I could have right now. So, you know, myself and Sloan, you know, as North Carolina um, Education First, we're pretty much excited to be trying to um, present these options along with all of the others that are in this space trying to make, you know, school choice, student choice, parent choice accessible. Exactly. And we'll tell you a little bit about how we're going to help families connect the dots, and then we're going to talk about Nicole's, uh, Danielle's great idea about the education heist, and I'm going to let you you talk about that in a second. But um, the the million dollar question is this: because you know we have all these great ideas, but a lot of them are maybe out of reach for parents. Um, I mean, we're talking to families all the time that are like, "Okay, how in the heck am I going to pay for private school? I don't even have a job right now." Um, and so uh, North Carolina is one of the best states to be in, in terms of funding options for school choice. And there are three main school choice um, options that are funded now. I'll talk about each three and break them down. One is the Opportunity Scholarship. Um, and that, that money is to be used by authorized private schools. Um, there's a list of them. There's a, a, a database of them. You can find them and I'll, I'll tell you more. Um, the second one is the um, education savings account, and that is um, up to $8,000, but I'm talking less about that because it's for um, special needs children. Um, there's also a special education grant, which again, um, that's available uh, for special needs uh, kids, but I'm going to talk less about that. Tonight, I'm going to talk about the opportunity scholarship. So a couple of things about, I want to demystify the scholarship. First of all, it is a um, a up to $4,200 per year per student grant um, that is given for students, like I said, who um, would like to attend a private school. So the first thing you would do if you wanted to apply for this grant is understand the application dates. It's February 1st to March 1st of this year. So this is a great time for this call. And then the money is awarded in October or in August. Okay, so that's right before the schools, um, the schools adjourn. So or start rather. So I set up to 4200. Um, and here's how that works. It just depends on your income level. For instance, if you have four kids and you make 72,000 and under, you're likely to get funded the full amount. So let's say it's a sliding scale a bit. Let's say you've got six kids. Um, or six people in your family, heaven help you, um, you would get, uh, that's a $97,000 limit. So the thresholds are, are flexible. Um, and here's, here's how it works. There are 15,000 available opportunity scholarships per year available. And I think I read, don't hold me to it, but there's about 12,000 families now that are participating. So that means there's, you know, there's some left over. Um, the way that you're selected for them is by lottery. So again, a couple of these options, you're rolling the dice, right? Um, and then let's say you live in Wake County. You would go to the website and you would say, okay, Wake County, let's see. Oh, all these schools are included. So I have those to choose from. Um, and then you're able to use some monies toward that. And so that is a way to, um, to definitely take the edge off. Now, Thales, like I said, I'm not advertising for Thales, but I'm saying it's 5,500. So if you, if you qualified for that, you'd, you'd almost be home free. Um, and so as far as private schools, let's see if we've got a number on that. Um, how many private schools are there? 754 and growing, um, depending on where you are. So there, there are a lot of them. Most of them are religious. Um, and so 
maybe it's good or bad, but that's, that's how they are. And so there's at this point, um, you know, again, we're still in the post office phase. DHL just started a year ago and then there's going to be more and more. And so that's kind of the way this field, this field is working. So um, with that, I'm going to, let's see, we're going to talk about one more thing and it's the great education heist. And Danielle um, ha and I came up with this. Our mission here is to, Danielle. <laughs> Our mission is to rescue a hundred students. Is that where we're at now? What, what's yep, in Wake County. Yep. <laughs> That's correct. A hundred students in Wake County from the public school system. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we say a rescue from, from the public school system is because, you know, education needs to get back to a certain brass tax that it used to have, which is kids went to school so that they can be able to compete in math and sciences and computers, et cetera, et cetera, to be successful in our job market. Um, even when you hear in the, the news, the idea that, you know, 11 million or so immigrants are going to be let into mm -hmm. the country. That just also continues to ramp up the idea that our students have to be able to compete. And especially in my community, um, education has been so instrumental to lifting children out of poverty, to keeping children from the, you know, the, the circle of, of just criminal activity and unnecessary involvement with the justice system. So, you know, with schools right now, they're pushing everything from uh, exploratory gender studies, you know, bathroom issues, this, that, and the next, critical race theory, which if you, it's just not a positive at all. Um, the way I look at it is, you know, when it comes to minority children, you know, they're being encouraged to be angry at someone else. White students are being encouraged to think of themselves, you know, less than due to, you know, just racial tensions and just society agendas. At the end of the day, who's still missing something? Black children are still missing both the esteem and the educational pieces that they need to succeed. So I think that if we pull our children from those extras, from the unnecessaries. If they want to do that, that's fine. As a conservative, I'm always about choice. However, everyone needs to have access to choices that are best for them. So right now, we're going to look to help parents that want to you know, pull their kids out of the education system. I'm going to demystify some of the unnecessary race allocations that come with uh, school choice options. This idea that when a minority parent discusses, oh, well, maybe I want to look at pulling my kid out of the school system, the number one thing that, you know, she's told, especially since in our community, there's a high rate of single motherhood, um, it's, well, if you take your kid out of school, there won't be enough money for the rest of the students. And we've got to take a look at, one, <laughs> wow. what, what expense so supersedes a cost per child rationale that literally pulling your child out of school or even pulling 500 kids out of, out of a school in a certain county would cause the education system not to function. If it's because of the cost of buildings, maybe we're spending too much on buildings. If it's textbooks, maybe we're spending too much on textbooks. If it's utilities, Maybe they're spending too much, but I will say that in addition to the, the race issue, this idea that uh, school choice and private schools and certain charter schools and mag uh, magnet schools are the privilege of this elite or white wealthy, we need to see it as an option that we can engage in and that will empower us as well. In addition to the fact that, you know, we've got we've to pull uh, student choice we like to call it parent choice. We like to call it over school choice um, that we've got to champion that. We've got to champion that in our communities and pull it so far from the race complex that we can be able to reach parents and say, hey, this is a great option you should engage in because it's for the benefit of our communities. Exactly. And to that, um, what our organization will do is find transportation options um, and lunch options for families that 
are not able to make ends meet. So even if we did give them, they qualify for the opportunity scholarship, maybe they would need an extra, you know, 5,000 or some other resources to pull that together. And so our fundraising efforts um, will, will do that. And our partners will um, help make that gap, um, close the gap. And so with our targeting, we wanna hit specifically um, families who have been un underserved and who are frankly being used as pawns as Danielle said, I mean, completely left behind in the public school uh, system right now. I mean, you know, we're we're pretty, uh, we're a little bit more ideological than than some of you. I mean, this is, um, you know, we we do it for other reasons, but there's many reasons that um, students who are being left behind should absolutely uh, be giving a hand up, not a hand out, mm -hmm. and that's exactly what we intend to do here. That is our mission. Yeah, I will definitely say, and that's why we need, you know, everyone's partnership with it. I mean, when it comes to the reason why um, the educational opportunity scholarships have not been used as much as, you know, would have liked in our communities because no one has stepped up to solve the transportation problem and the school lunch problem. And that's one of the things that we have done to say, hey, we need to tackle this as well. The idea of creating and I, and I gotta keep taking us back to that. We've gotta start creating the parallel economies that are gonna make us able to survive in, in a world where sometimes our, our values and our outlooks are not shared and make sure that neither our families nor our children are at a disadvantage because of everybody else's preferred choices even right. though they might not be ours. So we're really excited about this problem. Uh, this problem. Well, it is a problem, but we're really excited about this project. We're gonna solve it. Yeah, because it's the most aggressive yeah. attempt anyone has taken to really move the needle when it comes to student choice and parent choice. Absolutely. So with that, we've got um, time to take a couple of questions. And so um, forgive me, I don't know how this works, but take yourself off of mute if you have a question for us and we'll try to answer you. And go. Well, I think Tracy uh, might have one. She put a question in the chat. Tracy, okay. are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hey, Tracy. Hey, um, I live in Cumberland County, and um, you know, I, I'm more interested in. I know um, Sloan had mentioned just a little bit about it, but my daughter has special needs, and so you know, what's been difficult for me is, you know, finding a private school that can accommodate her IEP or that, you know, it seems like the cost for special needs kids in the private sector is a lot more than it would be for a typical child. So that's more of what I'm, and I don't know a whole lot about the whole school choice thing as it pertains to children with special needs. If if that's something that's even an option, because I mean, you know, she's um, right now in a moderate um, intellectually disabled class. So, I mean, the idea of her ever going to college, I mean, I'm sure, you know, is not gonna happen for her. So she's likely gonna need someone that's gonna care for her for the rest of her life. So I don't know what options are out there for someone that's in my situation. Well, there's a couple of options. So if we look at the funding front first, so out of the three funding options that North Carolina has set up, you hit the jackpot because there's two for you. And oh, by the way, I want to tell everyone that you can apply for all three. That's the great thing. You can apply for the Opportunity Scholarship, for the, um, the Special Education Fund, and the Education Savings Fund. And so while I admit I don't know the specifics of that, um, I'm going to email you the website and you can go on there and apply for that. And that's, that would be my recommendation. And here's why. Number one, you're going to qualify for, for these monies for special needs, uh, already. And that will provide, um, tutors, which is great. Um, and, and some therapy services. And so that's going to give you some flexibility. Also, let's just say you win the true jackpot, right? And you get the three cherries across the, uh, little slot machine and you get the opportunity scholarship well then you can look and say okay here are the the private schools in my area may not be many full disclosure uh but you're you'll maybe find some that do take special special needs children but i will tell you this that charter schools 
do a great job with that. And a lot of them do service um, uh, special needs. And so that's another thing. You can also maybe hit the four jackpot and apply for the charter school and get accepted. And so um, being innovative is something that we're, we're just going to have to expand our mind. Let's say that you don't know, but there are um, three retired teachers that are in your area. They don't have anything to do. You advertise, hey, I need somebody for two hours a day, et cetera, to do this. And, you know, this is what I can do. Or maybe this money pays for that. I believe it does. And then you've got something. So I have found that cobbling together a solution for me, it worked better than my wildest imagination. And so that may be something. Yeah, I was going to also add that, you know, special needs children have been the most overlooked throughout yeah, all of this. And, yeah. you know, bringing these sort of like um, information holes, um, that's another thing that as Education First Alliance, we're trying to do. We're trying to better the resources available in one place for people to search. So if there needs to be a special listing of charter and private um, schools that actually specialize in, in special needs, you know, children and IEPs, that might be another resource that we look to actually put together and make available on our website. The goal is to aggressively go after the school choice options that are available and then work with parents to implement them as much as possible. So we're going to be a resource for you completely as much as we can and put together those resources and just keep checking with us as we update the website, send us emails like people are already yeah. doing. Let us know your stories. We need to hear your stories because we collect these stories when we determine, okay, what's needed, what maybe legislation wise needs to be taken care of. So I really appreciate you all on this call um, and send us those stories. So next will be Katie. Hey, can you hear me all right? I can, we can. Hey, Katie. Okay. Hey, I don't have the video on. I hope that's okay. Um, that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So quick question. Okay. Um, my background, so currently I'm a real estate agent, but prior to that, um, I was a teacher for 11 years and I spent 10 of those years in Wake County. God love um, you. So, so, you know, I believe, you know, in the public school system and there are great teachers out there. My concern is this. Um, my biggest concern, without even getting into this whole COVID shutdown thing, my biggest concern is the change of the curriculum in regards to social studies with like the 1619 project and Black Lives Matter and stuff like that, um, and how that's going to get integrated into the curriculum for our children. And the way I kind of brought it up to a friend of mine who works for DPI, I said, you know, she's, we kind of differ politically, but we are good friends and can talk about it. I said, look, if the school was going to say, hey, we're going to start teaching Bible lessons now and teaching about Jesus, I would be all for it. I think that's great, but you would not because you don't feel like that's appropriate for school and that should be done at home. I feel like this stuff that they're taught, you know, with the, the Black Lives Matter and the 1619 is not school appropriate. And that is where the, you know, it's the job of the parents to teach about, you know, social justice and skills and stuff. So, you know, that's kind of where I'm at with where I am at where, right now with public schools is, you know, I believe in public schools in the sense that there's great teachers, yeah. but if that, they start pushing that curriculum, I don't really want my kids being, you know, that yeah. taught and we can't afford private and charter is very hard to get into. So it's kind of like, you know, we're stuck. Well, we have, to, we have uh, something to address that. So we also have on the, on the other side of what we do, something called Unity Commons. And what it is, is a patriotic study club. And I'll tell you how it works. So we realize that, you know, we're formed from the inside. I mean, look at, we're being carpet bombed right now from, from these programs. I mean, every single day, it is like, it is coming fast and it's, it's really hard. It's like whack-a-mole, right? You think mm -hmm. one, one uh, part of the curriculum is temporized and then you're going into teaching about, you know, Everyone, nobody has a gender, so it, it is. So what we decided to do is this, patriotic study clubs. We just had our first one on Friday night. We had 27 kids show up. We're doing something called counter-programming. In other words, we're, we're saying, okay, you, you know, public schools, you win. To your point, you, you win, you're gonna do that. Um, we're gonna provide the counter narrative and let children decide for themselves because that's really what's missing is that I think we'd have less of an argument, right? If the public school would say, here's Black Lives Matter and here's the counter argument, right? That's called teaching. 
that's called learning. And so we're having these every week, go on our website, uh, look at the events, they're free, they're for middle and high schoolers. Uh, they're, they're three hour um, events where this particular one, we showed no safe spaces. So we, we use PragerU stuff and we use 1776 uh, curriculum. Uh, but our point is we're gonna bring together black, white, Hispanic, Muslim, Asian, whoever. Our point is unity commons, unity learning. So this was no safe spaces where we learned about the First Amendment, academic freedom, and, and taught students to stand up to be it. I'm not gonna be canceled. I'm going to stand up, giving them the skills they need. February 12th and Kerry is our, our second one. Um, and it's going to be our Black History Edition where we're gonna hear from some of the greatest scholars and arguers of our time, Dr. Thomas Sowell. Uh, we're going to hear, uh, we're going to not, of course, we're not going to hear from Frederick Douglass, but we're going to, you know, read some of his greatest arguments. Um, and then, of course, Candace Owens, uh, which always gets people excited. But, you know, it, some of the greatest minds arguing about American exceptionalism and about what makes this country great for everybody, that is lacking. And that is what our children need and our society needs to heal and to truly be Americans and not balkanized. And so Katie, we hear about this a lot. There are great teachers, but you know, we've, we've got a tidal wave coming down on our children right now. So again, Unity Commons, if you go on our website, edfirstnc.org, edfirstnc.org, um, we have them in Wake, we're coming to Mecklenburg. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and we're, we're our team, we're Oreo. Half of us, <laughs> half of us are black, half of us are white. Uh, I'm Jewish, so we can sort of, <laughs> we, we mix it up. We're like the UN. So, you know, but we all, but you know what? We all have the same values. Yeah. That's most, Simone, how much time do we have? Because I was going to mention one thing. Two minutes. We got, we got two minutes. Okay. Yeah. So just to kind of tighten up on the answer uh, to your question. Reel it in. They not when the culture war in schools. Unity Commons is a supplement to the fact that we can't change the trajectory the schools seem to be on. So we have these other resources and after school programs, weekends, stuff like that to supplement while we work on creating that parallel economy. So just hang in there. I think that that's a slight myth that private schools are so expensive. I found some that's much more affordable than people would expect, but that's where we'll come with our research to kind of you know be more of a resource to all of you. What's the lowest price you found for private school? Um, 2000 a year, which is actually not bad. And that's before applying for a scholarship. So if you've got scholarship money on top of that, that would definitely put a dent in that. So I, I, I think it's a myth that they're so expensive. Of course, there are some that are, but there's still some great quality education in the private school arena that is much more affordable than we think. Okay, great. And so we're going to close the meeting up now, but I want to thank all of you for taking the time to hear a little bit about us. We hope that we've been helpful. And um, I think, you know, it, shoot us an email anytime. Um, and uh, we're all, the cool thing is we're innovating together. We're like, remember, post office, we're kind of DHL, we're growing together, we're innovating. And so, and so great. So thank you guys. And, um, Danielle, thank you, and we'll have a great evening. Send us your stories, guys. Have a good night.